Good afternoon, students, or good uh, good morning, or good evening, whenever it is that you are listening to this review. This review is going to be for History 1302. Um, it is for Unit 2 exam that basically covers from 1900 uh, to um, the end of the New Deal. Okay, we're not going to cover the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Uh, we're going to take care of the bombing of Pearl Harbor uh, in the next unit, in Unit 3. Uh, this unit basically is going to cover World War One, the Great Depression, uh, the rise of, uh, of materialism uh, uh, in the 1920s, the stock market crash, and the New Deal. Okay. Now I can honestly tell you that about 50% of this exam will come out of the New Deal, uh, and then uh, about 25% will come out of uh, the 1920s and the Great Depression, and another 25% will come from uh, World War One. Now let's get started. Uh, first and foremost. One of the things that we need to wrap our head around, and I'm going to try and keep these videos to 20 minutes, so whatever it is that I can uh, squeeze in in 20 minutes, that's what, that's what we're going to get, okay? Um, uh, the most important thing that we need to focus on in World War I is that the United States doesn't get involved in it until the very end, okay? Now, World War I is uh, considered to be the first world war because so many countries get involved in it. You're going to have uh, the Central Powers, uh, which are basically going to be uh, Austria-Hungary, uh, Germany, uh, the Ottoman Empire, which is now Turkey. Um, those are the, the, the three primary uh, uh, Central Powers that I, that I want you to know. Okay. Now, the Allied Powers are Russia, the United States until very later. The United States is, doesn't get involved into the war until 1917. France, Belgium, Great Britain, uh, uh, Italy, of course, is also in, on, on the side of the Allies at this time. Now, to, to, to make a long story short, uh, what, the, what the British, the French, and the Russians had done is that they had made a pact, okay? Pretty much, Russia made a deal with uh, France that if anybody ever attacked France or anybody ever attacked Russia, they would come to each other's help. And Belgium and uh, uh, England had made the same deal. Okay, uh, so the diplomatic reasons for the war happening is basically. Uh, it's it's what it, it it's like a bunch of tag teams that are built up together, and when one gets attacked, then they all end up going into the war together. Okay, the the spark that sets everything off is the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo. Okay, by a Baku, Bakunin anarchist known as Garbilo Princip. Now, basically, what happens here is that. Austria-Hungary tells Serbia, uh, you did not do enough to take care of Bakunin anarchists, so we're going to attack you uh, for, you know, this Bakunin anarchist uh, killing Archduke Ferdinand and his pregnant wife. And when the Austro-Hungarians attack Serbia, then Russia attacks Austria-Hungary because Serbia and Russia had made an alliance. And then when Germany attacks Russia on behalf of Austria-Hungary, France then gets involved because they had created uh, a, a deal with the Russians. And then when the Germans decide to attack France by way of Belgium, by using Belgium roads, and they go through Belgium, they violate Belgium neutrality, and then England attacks Germany. And that's, that's how you have it. Now, there's a video that I posted there that is very important. I'm not going to worry too much about battles like I told you, but 
World War I is the first modern war, okay? It's the first war where a machine gun is used, okay? Hiram Maxim comes out with his machine gun and he sells it to all of the countries, okay? Uh, it is very efficient in, in killing people. Uh, we have trench warfare. We have the psychological effects of the tank and the airplane. I'm not saying that they're effective. I'm just saying that they had them. You know, and that makes uh, that makes people worry about you know. That. Actually, the people that were most in danger of getting killed in a tank or in a plane were actually the pilots and the crew of the tanks because they were so unreliable at the time. Okay. Uh, the other thing that they use in World War One uh, in the trenches is poison gas. Um, and that is always uh, dependent on the wind. So there's no way to control that. Uh, you had disease, you know, typhus, tuberculosis. You had lice, you know, on steroids. You had trench foot, which is basically the equivalent of really bad athlete's foot. Your feet were wet and they stayed wet for days on end. And it would basically just rot. Your skin would fall off like when you stay in a pool too long. And then, of course, you have the first, for the first time, they identify post-traumatic stress syndrome from the constant artillery bombings that went on. Now, the, the World War I quickly becomes a war of attrition, where one country wants to bleed the other dry. The idea is to kill as many of the other that those, that country will surrender. For example... The Germans want to kill as many French as they can so the French can just surrender. And that's going to be an issue. I had to yawn there and I held it. Uh, and that is going to be a problem, okay? This is basically a giant meat grinder where millions of soldiers are sacrificed, okay? And, with, and have no good end result at the end. At the end when they... When they sign the armistice, you know, it's like, well, what did we ever get into a fight about, you know? Um, so that in itself is going to be uh, an issue. Now, we're going to have an armistice. We're going to have a plan. We're going to have the creation of the League of Nations, which the United States doesn't join. And Woodrow Wilson, regardless of how little I think about him as a president, because he was a very racist individual, his... his uh, issues concerning uh, the peace process were actually really good. Uh, uh, he had a 14-point plan that didn't blame anybody, but of course, you know, Italy, France, and Great Britain did not want to hear anything of it, and this huge, unsurmountable amount of guilt and debt is put on Germany for starting the war, and by doing that, then that's going to be the precursor to World War II. World War II is basically a continuation of World War I, and the way that they go in there, that the Allied powers go in there, and they carve up the Middle East, and that they carve up Europe, creating countries along ethnic lines, and that's going to create a big issue, you know, and those are things that you can read about on your own. Okay, let's move on to uh, the Great Depression and uh, the 1920s. One of the things that we encounter after World War I is increased mass consumer spending, okay? And in order, uh, during World War I, um, I, didn't, I didn't talk about the United States getting involved in... Uh, World War One. So let me back up here. The United States gets involved in World War One when the uh, Tsar Nikolai or the Romanov uh, emperors are overthrown by Leninists. Okay, when uh, when Leninists overthrow the Tsar, they start making a deal with the Germans to sue for peace. And Wilson freaks out and he thinks that if Russia joins 
the war on the side of the Germans, then all of Europe is going to turn communist. And that's one of the main reasons that uh, the United States joins the war. Now, there's also the Zimmerman telegram, okay? That is a telegram where the United States uh, or Germany sends a telegram to Mexico and it says, hey, if you let us use Mexico as a, as a springboard to attack the United States, then we will give you all of the territory that was lost in 1848, okay? Uh, now, with that said, uh, uh, when the British decode that message, Mexico refuses to acknowledge that they have received it, uh, but... Wilson then recognizes the administration of Venustiano Carranza uh, as being the legitimate uh, administration, okay? So what happens then is that Mexico gets a little bit more leeway. Then there's also the sinking of the Lusitania. Um, and, you know, they do sink, the Germans do torpedo the Lusitania, but the United States still is reluctant to get involved in the war. And the Lusitania was carrying ammunition. So technically it could be sunk by the Germans because it was carrying supplies for the war. It was a belligerent ship, even though the United States claimed and, Brit and the British claim it wasn't. Okay. So that in effect is, is good. but the main reason that the United States joins the war, uh, World War I, is because of communism, okay? And to me, this is when uh, the co communism begins. It's the first red scare where in the United States, they go after anarchists, communists, Marxists, and then you have the very sad affair of Sacco and Vanzetti you have the jailing of anarchist uh, Ricardo Flores Magón. Uh, you also have stuff like the Palmer raids going on. Uh, uh, and you also have, uh, I can't remember his name right now, students, but uh, you have the jailing of, uh, I can't forget his name. He actually runs for president while he's in jail. Um, I cannot remember his name to save my life right now, but please forgive me. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry I kind of jumbled that up. I'm doing this without notes because I want to hurry up and get it out to you. Uh, in addition to that, uh, let's talk about the consumerism that comes out of World War One. During World War One, you know, we begin to have a really in high increased production, okay? More people are going to work. More people have money, more people start buying homes, more people start buying cards. So we need to keep that mass consumer spending. Now, this world that they live in now is not like the world that we have now. They don't have an assortment of things to spend money on. Things were a lot more limited. You have the emergence of department stores and stuff like that with uh, Sears Roebuck. But everybody was still buying essential items. Nobody was going out and buying Adidas shoes and different models. Or you didn't have vans that had 100 different styles or anything like that. You had boots, shoes, pretty much it. Very few people lived an opulent life. You know, it was, you, know you bought a, a mixer, then it was, that mixer was going to last you your whole life. Okay? So without the creation of mass consumer spending, you're, you're going to have a downturn in the economy. Now, the Great Depression wasn't caused by just one thing. The stock market crash only affected 3% of the population, okay? What you're going to have here is that you're going to have a lack of consumer spending. You're going to have a stock market crash. You're going to have job losses. That means that if people can't go to work, they can't pay their mortgages, they lose their homes. If they lose their homes, the banks don't get their payments on those homes. They can't make their dividend payments on the people that invested on the, on the building of these homes. So you have stagnation all the way around. This is a crash. The other thing that you have that a lot of people don't give enough credit to 
is environmental issues like the Dust Bowl. Okay, first, at the very beginning, we have a glut of, of wheat and food and all of the above, and then we go from feast to famine. So if farmers can't make payments on their equipment, if farmers can't make payments on their homes, then what's going to happen is, is that we're going to have stagnation in the economy. You know, money's not going to be turning around and the economy is going to crash. I need to learn to put it on pause when I do that, maybe. I don't know. Now, the other reason that we have this horrible problem of the Great Depression students is going to be because of the simple fact that there are no safety mechanisms to protect individuals. In other words, when the banks don't collect money and you go to get your money out of your savings account and there isn't any money there, there's no FDIC to help you. There's no Securities and Exchange Commission. There's no, uh, the, the government doesn't believe in doling out money to help. They don't uh, send stimulus checks or anything like that. It is just, there's nothing there. You know, we're still basically on the gold standard. We're not on a fiat standard. So uh, the United States doesn't get involved in this very much. It's not until the New Deal that the United States is going to get involved in these calamities. So what you're going to have is, again, in, 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 in the exam, I'm going to ask you, which of the following did not contribute to the Great Depression? You know, and you're, you're going to find the one that didn't contribute or contributed the least and tell me that's what it is. But the bottom line is that environmental bank, lack of money circulation, loss of job, loss of payments, you know, you name it. When the government gives us a stimulus check, they expect for us to go blow it. They expect for us to go buy things. That's how you stimulate the economy. Putting it in the bank and saving it, that's not the right thing to do. It, it actually, that doesn't help the economy at all. You just park the money in a bank and it's not doing anything. Okay? Good. Now, what I'm going to, no, I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and squeeze in the Great Depression and, 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 and the New Deal on this one. And I think I can, it'll probably go over into maybe 27 or 30 minutes, but uh, let me do this. And, and uh, so, with the government not doing anything, uh, we do have some issues uh, going on. People are protesting. You have the bonus army that marches on Washington where they want to go ahead and get their $2,500 credit that they were promised that they were supposed to get in 1945. Um, and of course, they are swept away by uh, future General uh, Douglas MacArthur and his tanks. The new president that comes in is FDR and he promises a new deal to everybody. He comes out to help the forgotten man and uh, women, okay, this is an individual who uh, is going to make uh, uh, better, okay, it's, you might, he's going to create jobs, uh, and the first thing that he does is that he declares a bank holiday. Now, when when he takes office one of the first things that he does is he de declares a bank holiday okay and this unit it's going to be riddled with alphabet soup administrations the fbb the ccc the nra not the national rifle association the fdic you know and i'll i'll tell them to you in both ways you know and what he does is that he tells the Federal Reserve to examine these banks. And the ones that are sound are allowed to stay in business. And the ones that folded because of mistakes that they made on their own that were honest mistakes were then helped. And the ones that were uh, made mistakes and that were crooked, uh, those are allowed to be bought out by bigger banks. Okay. What people don't like is that this is giving a lot more power to... Uh, to the federal government, but they are handling legal tender that belongs to the federal government. Okay, now the big corporation that's going to have a lot of 
smaller corporations under them. It's going to be the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the RFC. That's going to be the, the big one, okay? And the other thing that FDR does is that he starts his fireside chats, okay? That means that he talks to people, uh, and people like that. The day after uh, the banking uh, system is uh, investigated, and they passed the Banking Act of 1933, creates the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Uh, the Federal Securities Act creates the Securities and Exchange Commission. They also uh, repeal the 21st Amendment, uh, and the Beer and Wine Act does provide a little bit of revenue, but mostly it was to boost morale. People start depositing money back into their banks instead of keeping it at home okay now what do we do about agriculture because agriculture is really hurting at this time so what they do is that under the agricultural adjustment act they start a domestic domestic allotment plan where they start telling farmers to plant only so much because of over planting of course a lot of these programs are going to be deemed unconstitutional and because they're deemed unconstitutional FDR is going to have to come back and make these programs voluntary. Okay, in Butler versus the United States, uh, the Supreme Court says that the AAA is unconstitutional because the government cannot set production quotas and limits on farmers. And that's true. But if you want federal aid, then you've got to listen to what we have to say or the government has to say. It's kind of bothering me there. So um, I'm going to use it like that. Uh, so that's done now uh, there was a lot of excess and surplus grain that is basically burned a lot of livestock that is slaughtered and pretty much buried in the deserts of of the southwest but that's the only way that you're going to be able to increase the demand in goods is if you create a shortage in goods otherwise it's not going to happen anytime now he starts a similar program it's called the NIRA or NIRA as I've heard it called before and this program has a bunch of smaller programs underneath it like the public's work administration let's say you were a carpenter or a mason or a plumber you know they put you to work uh, uh, building schools building county offices uh, federal post office uh, you name it uh, now, uh, the National Recovery started the economic, I mean, the industrial aspect of it. It allowed uh, raising prices of goods, uh, hourly wages, the right to organize, it outlawed child labor. A lot of people say, well, the reason they outlawed child, they outlawed child labor was because they didn't want little kids working because they could get hurt. No, they didn't want little kids working because you can pay them less <laughs> and they don't. They're not, a, they're not the breadwinners of the family. They set minimum wages and minimum hours of working. Now, of course, it is deemed unconstitutional. Under the Sets to Port, the Poultry Corporation and the United States. That says that it is unconstitutional for the government to set national codes and set wages and hours in local plants. Of course, they're going to come back and overturn it later on and fix it in a way that it is be able to do that. Now, we also get rural America is going to get the Tennessee Valley Authority to bring uh, dams where uh, there used to be seasonal flooding. And then you're going to have the creation of hydroelectric plants under the rural electrification, which means the relocation of towns uh, in the United States that were really close to rivers, which means that these people are now going to get newer homes with electricity and all of the above. Okay. In addition to that, we're going to have the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. This is one of my favorite programs. What do you do about all those kids that are between the ages of, you know, 16, 18, and 25 that are running amok? Well, you put them in a program that is army style and you send them out to replant in the Dust Bowl to spread grass seed or to plant, plant pine trees or, you know, anything like that. You get them out. You, and in Texas, they do a lot of work of replanting grass in the 
panhandle and they also build a lot of the state parks and in my face-to-face -face lecture I actually go into that okay in addition to that you're gonna have programs like um, really basic programs like the Civilian Works Administration and FERA, the Emergency Federal Relief Administration that eventually is going to become FEMA. Uh, when you look at programs like the Civil Works, Civil Works Administration, this is busy work. This is the kind of work that you would do if you were to get a ticket and you needed to work it off. They would send you to clean up parks and to shovel snow and that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, now, uh, you got to create, you're going to have to create uh, an army of bureaucrats to run this program. You know, programs like the program that's going to come up, like Social Security and stuff like that. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, while most people were happy, there were some individuals that were not. And that would be Huey Long, Francis Townsend, and Father Coughlin. And you're going to have to read about these individuals on your own. My favorite is Huey Long. He was Share the Wealth. This guy was crooked. More crooked than a barrel of snakes, man. But he believed that uh, the government needed to provide every family with an annual check for two grand, 2000 bucks, uh, And that pretty much turned into the earned income tax credit. A home. We have, the, uh, we have the FHA now that can help us secure a home. A car. That doesn't work out for us. Um... A radio and a college education okay a college education is going to come by way of Pell Grants and financial aid and that stuff Francis Townsend was a public health doctor who advocated for a federal old age pension plan uh, which is I think it's going to become uh, Medicare and then Medicaid and of course you know Social Security which be is an old age pension plan and uh, uh, Father Coughlin uh, kind of got a little bit of both Huey Long and Francis Townsend, okay? Uh, now, a shift from focus. You know, you got to, you, you can't just, a lot of these programs were scheduled to be terminated. Be, why? Well, because the government just can't be pumping money into the economy. At some point, the economy has to boost itself and start all over again. But you still had programs like the National Youth Administration that creates a lot of pro, pro, programs in high school, like ROTC or ROTC, or you know you had uh, home economics, or you had welding, or you had DECA, or air conditioning and refrigeration. We're going to have the passing of the Social Security Act. Uh, we're going to have the passing of the Wagner Act at this time. Now, one of the things that happens, students, is that what FDR tries to do when he gets a lot of resistance to that is that he decides that he's going to pack the courts with new with new judges and this is not a good thing you don't mess around with the Supreme Court okay you don't create positions to, to favor you if it happens to be that you get to appoint a judge that's going to listen to the to your tune of music then that's fine but you don't create positions just to to get what you want and this really hurts FDR now what really helps FDR is that the poor people who were getting some relief vote for him in droves I mean when you look at pictures of his of the electoral college uh, what he went it's it's just insane the way that the map looks okay um, what is striking about FDR is not the fact that he was so giving with government money was the way that he thought I mean this guy was incredibly rich I mean he uh, he wasn't even nouveau rich he, this guy was wealthy in a way that we can't understand and he is known as a traitor to his kind a lot of wealthy people actually thought that he had turned his back on the wealthy uh, another thing that really helped him a lot was his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, that was always in his ear. You need to look at African Americans. You need to look at, you know, women. You need to have a woman cabinet uh, appointee. And that, that was, uh, uh, I think it was Francis Perkins. Don't quote me on that. 
Look it up, because I sometimes forget. I'm pretty sure it's Francis Perkins. He had an unofficial black cabinet, okay, which he looked to African Americans to uh, um, uh, tell them what African Americans needed instead of asking others who were not African American what they needed. Okay, uh, with the help of Eleanor, women get a lot of attention. During the Depression, women had reached a level of independence where they were bringing in money. Uh, they were in the workforce, and the paycheck changes the role of women within the family, okay? That is in itself very important. Mexican Americans and African Americans did not benefit from the New Deal like others did because of the leeriness of their government. And the other thing is that if you had a blue collar job, uh, Social Security wasn't didn't cover blue collar jobs just yet. Did uh, so it did cover blue collar jobs, but you had to be working. For like a company or something you couldn't be like self-employed or that's what i mean uh so i'm at 30 minutes uh there's a lot of things that i did not cover i want you all to use your my lecture notes you know uh that i have i think it let me see right here right where it says chapter 21 world war one and its aftermath I would strongly suggest that you all pay attention to those notes, okay? Uh, there's some stuff here on World War One that I didn't cover, like CPI, Committee of Public Information, Espionage Act, Sedition Act. That's important. Victory Gardens are very important. Uh, African American Migration, okay? The Great Migration. Uh, let's see right here the new era advertising uh, increased consumption buy now pay later the advent of the automobile model T uh, homogenized cultures and heroes that is important uh, this is where we start going about one fat after another homogenization is not a good thing students okay it's not good just to, you know, there's got to be some individual creativity here that we uphold on our own. We also see the beginning of alienation in the United States where you have uh, books like The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, you see the emergence of a gay and lesbian society at this time. And the Harlem Renaissance. I mean, hey, you know, a new outpouring of music and artistic talent by African Americans and then you know uh, the youth you know they call them flaming youth that uh, the hippies of the 1920s the flappers and the speakeasies and the drinking and all this other stuff that's going on at the time an increased amount of sex outside the marriage the problem is is that there's no oral contraceptive so that's not going to help anybody and then, of course, again, we have the Sacco and Vanzetti trial, and we're going to have the Scopes trial. So I want you to touch on that. Now, the Scopes trial was about was a battle between rural and urban, Catholics and Protestants, and nativism and new immigrants, okay? It's the whole idea of science over biblical stuff, you know, and we still see that today, you know, that... A lot of people refuse to think that they that we have evolved from something else. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, the reemergence of the Ku Klux Klan. I don't like to spend a whole lot of time on that. And then, of course, the change in Indian policy. Uh, we also have the Mexican Revolution that's going on. So there is a lot here. But, I mean, I can sit here and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Uh, use the lecture notes that I use for as a the bullet to my class and I hope that this has helped I've gone into 35 almost 35 minutes I'm gonna cut it short um, I still have to do a review for 1301 you all take it easy and uh, I will be posting your exam soon